zapraszam naszą pierwszą, naszego pierwszego gościa z Estonii, panią Eli Pilwę. Pani Eli Pilwę zajmuje się badaniem okupacji radzieckiej na terenie swojego kraju, zajmuje się ideologią, ideologią marksistowską, wpływem ideologii na funkcjonowanie różnych, różnych instytucji działających na terenie Estonii, a poznaliśmy się w bardzo miłych okolicznościach, bo poznaliśmy się w Rumunii. Zapraszam Cię Eli, come on. My name is Eli Pilwę, I assume that uh, Marcin already told that, but I didn't understand. And I come from Estonian Institute of Historical Memory, where I have written two-part study about ideolog ideological pressure in Soviet school system. And uh, during this uh, study, I, of course, uh, also focused uh, to teachers, how it affected, uh, how this pressure affected them also, not only the pup pupils. Uh, so, in this uh, brief overview, I am uh, not going to focus on the, a lot of data. I'm not going to focus on the acts and numbers because um, then I would do that uh, the next 20 minutes and more. And if someone of you can't get sleep uh, during the evening, then I can do that. Um, and my uh, study, uh, it's two-parted. Uh, the first of uh, it uh, focuses uh, on the period after uh, the Second World War uh, till the death of Stalin. And the second part uh, focuses uh, to the school system and ideological pressure from 1953 till 1991 when Estonia uh, managed to declare its re-independency. So, uh, briefly, what was the aim of ideological education? It was meant to build up uh, so-called homo sovieticus, so that um, persons in Soviet Union wouldn't feel themselves themselves as like Estonians or, or Latvians, but Soviet people. Uh, that's why the government uh, forced replacing all the national values with the Soviet ones. Very shortly, it, mean, it meant that everything before 1917 was uh, taken as a prologue to the Great October Revolution. It also included, in a great way, uh, Russia, Russianization. Uh, because although Soviet ideology uh, said that uh, every nation in Soviet Union is equal with another one, and uh, said about friendship, uh, friendship of all the people, uh, still, the Russians were actually more equal. For example, if we look at uh, the textbooks of that time, of literature, then it's, it's not often, it's always so that we find, find uh, some examples of other countries, one from one country, uh, another from another country, and then there's three of Russian writers. It also, till the end of uh, Stalin's uh, death, uh, included Stalin's cult. And uh, when we are not uh, talking about Stalin's cult, then basically uh, the system stayed the same till the end of the collapse of Soviet Union. The changes in school system uh, started immediately after the occupation of Soviet Union. 
But in the first year in Estonia, in 1940 till 1941, it was rather not formal, not a real content, because it was just not enough time. Since 1944, the system changed it, uh, in actual way, and there was no escape anymore. And although I promised, uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, the different uh, acts, acts, then there is still one that I have to mention, because it was the basis for the whole ideological sub suppression, and especially the so-called struggle against bourgeois nationalism, which was also the main idea of this um, ideological edu education. And uh, it was taken in autumn 1944 by the organizing bureau of the Central Committee of the Communist Party and it adopted the drawbacks and further tasks in the political work of ESSR party organization. In my research, um, um, there's a, my base is uh, not only archive documents, and other books, but also interviews uh, with the teachers who were working back then. So it clearly um, shows the difference uh, between acts and commands uh, and the reality, which quite often, in a way, not 100%, but in a way, stayed in paper. So like I already told, this um, first year, 1940 till 1941, was introduction. Uh, but then the ideological pressure, um, I have uh, tiled my study into phases, uh, how it was changing. So from, like I already said, then that um, from 1945 till 1943, the pressure was the strongest, and it was a real fear. It was uh, either I report to someone, or someone accuses me of doing something wrong. Uh, teachers were fired, uh, sent to another work, or even uh, put into prison, because the only mm, problem they had was that they already had worked during the Estonian independence time. Uh, this pressure in that time was so strong that uh, the teachers were forced uh, to control uh, their pupils, uh, for example, um, during Christmas, they were forced to go there and look if someone of the kids is going to the church. And they were, uh, the system worked that way that if the teacher wasn't uh, telling about it to the director, uh, then the director became problems. Uh, when the director didn't tell about it, then the part of the party became problems. Of course, there are a lot of uh, other examples how um, people were staying, sticking together and recovering one another. But this uh, system gave a great opportunity to accuse people. For, ex just for example, to think something out and accuse your neighbor which you didn't like. Uh, for example, my grandma my grandpa was arrested in 1952 uh, because he had had, uh, had one forest uh, man in his property. They were both uh, imprisoned and sent to Siberia. In Kolkhoz, there was a meeting and uh, there was a question. Uh, the people of the Kolkhoz had to uh, had to vote whether the husband of my uh, grandpa, my, my grandmother, 
was allowed to stay in Tokolkos or was, uh, did she have to leave as well to, to become without a job, which was, non, uh, which, was, which was actually not allowed during the Soviet time. Everyone had to have a job. So, of course, everyone had to, uh, to vote for, because otherwise they had had problems themselves. But uh, there's a legend that the neighbor didn't only raise one hand, but both of them. So it always um, depended on the people. Uh, then after Stalin's death, it was a relief time. The pressure got uh, lower. In the year of uh, 70s, the pressure uh, got stronger again. And the years of uh, 80s, it was such a um, funny, so-called funny phase, because the pressure got even more stronger on the one side. But on the other side, there was a national movement, which, which also got more and more stronger. So, back to the teachers. Uh, their main, uh, what was the main, uh, how, how the ideological work uh, mainly affected their everyday life? First of all, textbooks. Uh, of course, uh, after occupation, at first, there were so-called old textbooks, which were not suitable anymore. The teachers had to be very careful how they are using them uh, during the classes, because you, uh, especially, yeah, especially afterwards, there was no old textbooks. But at first, uh, it was a great fear. You never knew who's controlling you, because if there wasn't the inspector or director in your class uh, listening, what, do you, what are you going to say, then you never know whose kid is in your class. What is he or she going to tell at home? And kids, they don't have to be mean, they just naive. They can say something wrong, so-called wrong, somewhere. And it may cause a lot of problems. Not only textbooks, uh, these old uh, textbooks at all at first were reprinted uh, in a corrected way. Uh, there wasn't not allowed, um, uh, there was not allowed, for example, in math uh, uh, textbooks, there was not, you couldn't say, in teaching something there, you couldn't say that the farm was sold or bought because no one could uh, sell a farm in in Soviet Union. Everything belonged to the state. Uh, the teachers became uh, governmental guidelines how to bring ideological education into every single lesson. And it was uh, outlined to do it in every single lesson. Not only social sciences, where it was a bit more easier but also in uh, natural sciences. For example, there was a guideline for geography lesson where teachers were forced to, um, to make an example of Estonian uh, agrarian reform in 1919 that it didn't solve the problem, uh, the, it didn't solve the land problem. The land problem was solved by Soviet Union. The teachers were also forced into the uh, Communist Party. And of course, not all of them uh, went there, but it was a pressure. And as I already said, it was always a control over the lessons. Director, inspector, part talk, and children. Um, the teachers' experience, uh, mostly after the Stalin era, are saying that uh, the papers and reality were different, were different. They had to write down three aspects to every single lesson. 
it's the subject of the lesson, what they are, for example, history, what they are uh, learning in this uh, history uh, lesson in this data, the method, how they are doing it, and the ideological upbringing. The last one, as the teachers have told me, usually stayed on the paper and the teachers often copied them from one another. For example, if someone has found an appropriate article from a newspaper, then they were uh, writing there that they are talking about this article there. Unless, there, and actually they wasn't uh, using this material, ideological upbringing material, unless there was someone controlling in the class because it was a system that um, every once in a while, inspector or part or, or director came into the class and listened to the, to the study. And teachers also had themself, themselves compulsory lectures at schools. They had to make reports, of the, they had to do the reports themselves of an ideological upbringing from the teachers. How they are, example again, history or math, how they are uh, following this ideological upbringing in, the, in their lessons. They had to listen uh, to the lectures of party members. And they also had to listen to political lectures from the Ministry of Education and etc. And it was something you, you had to deal with it um, back then and probably, only, probably not only as a teacher, but also in other areas of life. And as I already said, that uh, in the end of the day, everything depended on the person. There were fanatic directors, bar talks, teachers, teachers who really believed in this ideology and, and the ones who didn't. And I have heard a lot of examples how if there were some kind of problems, let's say the inspector was very fanatic and, and said to some teacher that, no, I'm going to write it down, you're going to be fired. This is not the way to teach people. Then if the director was so-called person, then usually this problem could have been solved uh, normally, so that the teacher had uh, it, his or her job, and yeah, it was solved. Uh, but this, uh, all this ideological uh, upbringing meant a lot of paperwork. Like I already, it's already said, it uh, included compulsory lectures. Just sitting and hearing, listening to them, although you had a lot more um, important things to do. And it, it included faking when it was needed. Uh, so, when, uh, when I was talking to these different teachers, they all said that it was useless. It was useless for themselves. It was useless for pupils. It came, the ideology, ideology, ideology <laughs> I can't pronounce it anymore. It came from home. If the teacher or the pupil uh, already believed in uh, the power of Soviet Union, believed that it's the right thing to do, then he or she didn't need any upbringing anymore. If they didn't, it also couldn't change a thing. It was uh, the national ideology, ideology was forbidden. And of course, when something is uh, forbidden, the more tasty it is. And to and this really, really brief overview about this, how ideological education 
affected teachers' everyday life. Uh, I would like to share my own memory from 1991. Uh, actually, it was for me, it was in 1992 or three. In 1991, Estonia got its independence back again. The teachers had the same system. The textbooks were old. They were free to talk about another ideology, to talk about, to freely talk about Estonians, Estonia's history, literature, whatever. But I was, I think I was in second grade when I had a um, literature textbook from the beginning of 80s. And we were reading something from the and uh, the next chapter was about the great Lenin. And our teacher said that this one we are going to skip. God, it was, it was interesting. Why we are going to skip it? It has never happened before. And everyone um, read it at home. And everyone were playing Lenin the next day at school. <laughs> so thank you. Dziękuję bardzo pani Eni Pilwe. Celem tego, tej części jest porównanie rzeczywiście, jak wyglądało to w innych krajach bloku, a jak wyglądało to w Polsce. Ja tak od razu na bieżąco mam kilka refleksji. Eli powiedziała, że przez jakiś czas korzystano z podręczników, które były dawne. Ja akurat jakiś czas temu, kilka miesięcy temu próbowałem to zbadać na przykładzie podręczników historii. I u nas dla odmiany dosyć szybko wprowadzono podręczniki wzorowane Najpierw tak bardzo bezpośrednio na tym, co było w Związku Radzieckim, a później po 56 roku drukowano różne rzeczy dla, dla młodzieży licealnej ze szkół podstawowych, ale co ciekawe jeszcze w latach 80. bardzo wiele rzeczy było podobnych do tego, co drukowano w 1956 i innych. Eli mówiła, że na każdej lekcji czy na wielu lekcjach prowadzono jakieś zajęcia czy mówiono o sprawach ideologicznych. Kilka miesięcy temu znajoma znalazła swojego taty zeszyty szkolne z przełomu lat 40. i 50. Ja byłem w ogóle zaskoczony, jak one pięknie wyglądają. Chyba nigdy tak pięknie nie pisałem i mój syn też z pewnością tak nie pisze. Natomiast przejrzałem te zeszyty i spraw ideologicznych ku mojemu zaskoczeniu było bardzo niewiele. Spodziewałem się tych rzeczy, dlaczego Lenin jest moim bohaterem i tak dalej. Nie, nie, nie było tego. Wykryłem też niedawno w Lublinie a propos kształcenia nauczycieli taką szkołę, która przysposabiała właściwie ludzi do pełnienia zawodu nauczyciela na przełomie lat 40. i 50. I też ku mojemu zaskoczeniu niewiele było zajęć z podstaw marksizmu-leninizmu. Wydawało mi się, że na to położy się nacisk, ale być może dlatego nie kładziono na to nacisku, bo zaczynała się realizacja wielkiego planu gospodarczego. Byli nam potrzebni specjaliści, fachowcy, którzy powinni byli może jednak czegoś nauczyć, a nie tylko, nie tylko ideologii. Natomiast a propos maniaków ideologii, to ja w warunkach lubelskich też jednego mężczyznę zdiagnozowałem, ale co ciekawe po 56 roku on wraz ze zmianą wijącego wiatru natychmiast zadeklarował się jako człowiek bardzo, bardzo wierzący. Także był takim ciekawym maniakiem ideologii, bardzo znanym na, na rynku lubelskim. Ale to tyle, tyle ode mnie. Iży już czeka i stoi. Przepraszam cię bardzo serdecznie. Iży jest też taką moją cenną znajomością z Rumunii. Jest, y, zajmuje się od kilku lat badaniem kolektywizacji. Przygotował przynajmniej dwie takie duże prace na ten temat. Iży, oddajemy ci głos. 20 minutes, please. Is it working? Okay. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would mention that it's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, yeah, uh, thank you for the invitation for for this event. Uh, my conference paper uh, is concerned with the transformation of the status of peasants uh, through the collectivization of the Czechoslovak countryside uh, after the communist takeover in February uh, 1948. 
On the process of the transformation, we will have a look uh, not only in terms of political development, uh, but also from a micro historical perspective. We will have a look at specific impacts uh, into the villages influencing everyday life, working condition, standard of living, standard of cul uh, cultivation and land management, as well as farmers' mentality. So, let me start. Uh, under the influence of informed bureau resolution about Yugoslavia from the summer of 1940-48, Czechoslovakia uh, does had to accept the Soviet way of building socialism. Subsequently, uh, the economy and the society ensured into uh, the entire of life uh, the communist centrally administrative system started to be implemented. In the sphere of rural economy, uh, the gist of such a system was collectivization. Officially, the collectivization in Czechoslovakia was introduced uh, uh, by the passing of bill about the Unified Agriculture Cooperatives in February 1949. Uh, sorry. Uh, in the following years, the private farmers who were uh, by the communist propaganda called village rich maybe it would be understandable, uh, the Czech expression, Vesnický Boháč, or the, uh, from a, uh, 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 Soviet, uh, Soviet Russia uh, brought uh, kulaks, uh, began to be systematically persecuted. So let's say that uh, the part of everyday life in the village at the time was the fear. In June 1953, uh, monetary reform was implemented and the, uh, ending the practice of double, it means fixed and free market. The complete uh, uh, discontinuation of rationing occurred eight years after, after the war, and in view of absolute uh, nullification of savings uh, was welcomed by few. In addition, there was a critical lack of everyday goods uh, as the consumer industry had deferred to the party steel philosophy. philosophy. The majority felt cheated and rapt. People cursed, but nobody said anything. Everybody just gripped uh, uh, among the, their neighbors, recalled eyewitnesses of that oppressive atmosphere. The monetary reform led to a significant fall in living standards and left people with a bitter sense of impoverishment. After such a drastic monetary reform and the first mass anti-communist uh, demonstration, the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia uh, had to compromise on its efforts uh, with the Unified Agriculture Cooperative's founding. Uh, let me use uh, here and after uh, the Czech abbreviation uh, JZD, JZD, as Jednotné uh, Zemědělské Družstvo, was the uh, Czech version of collective farm. There were uh, rumors spreading through the Czechoslovak countryside with regard to the situation in GDR that, uh, I quote, there isn't a need to build collective farms, that the land will be returned to the farmers anyway. The collectivized farmers started quitting JZDs on a mass scale. Hundreds of JZDs around the country ceased to function. Within 10 months, uh, the number had reached more than one and a half thousand. Let me consider at this point the events uh, that have taken place in the small farming community uh, of Swatoyansky U.S. The local collective farm, does JZD, established under the pressure in uh, 1952, and. Uh, at, the, at the turn of uh, 1953 and 54, uh, uh, definitely fell apart. Uh, by the way, among uh, the first who left JZD uh, were those who owned uh, from 7 to 10 hectares and from just half to 4 hectares uh, of land. Uh, as you know, uh, these were uh, the mid-sized and small farmers uh, that, according to the regime's propaganda, were the leading supporters of collectivization. The local chronicle uh, was aware of the farmers' negative stance towards the JZD project forced upon them, recording that the overwhelming majority of farmers who have joined the JZD 
have been working towards its liquidation from the very start and that the class war in the municipality is not following the right direction. Further insight into the mood of, uh, of the countryside uh, at the time is provided by a more striking case heard by Ota Ulch uh, as a district judge uh, at the time in Stribro. In front of him was uh, the strange case of bankruptcy following the establishment of a JZD, by the way, of one of the best municipalities in the district. Uh, the chairman of that local national committee provided a testimony strongly reflecting uh, deterioration in, uh, in the attitude to work. I quote, when I work for myself, I was already out uh, in the field at 5 a.m. And my neighbor was already plowing. Then they pushed us into the kolkhoz, and after the noon, we were still arguing about who should do what. Our main concern was not working a minute longer than the others. And because less and less was done, uh, in the end, nothing at all was done. And our famous cooperative was screwed. That's how it was, he explained it uh, simply. And of quotation. In the summer of 1954, the local farmers carried out their own harvest. Even the Orthodox communists, the local teacher and chronicle uh, named Kowanda, had to admit that compared to the previous collective harvest, uh, the farmers worked hard all the hours they could, even on Sundays. Uh, later, he wrote uh, in the municipal commemorative books, I quote, from the very start of the harvest, a completely different work ethic was visible compared to the previous harvest when our farmers worked collectively. This year, when our farmers again started work individually, the harvest went more smoothly for everybody. End of quotation. The following year, the harvest again took place without any problems and many farmers exceeded their supply obligation. According to the Chronicle, the yield of all types of cereal was about average at that year. Uh, it may have seemed then that there was no point into, no, in introducing uh, any changes, that the return to private farming in Svatojansky West had confirmed once and for all the failure of collectivization experiment. Many farmers started to stand in hope uh, of the end of collectivization, but they were wrong. Soon a new push uh, for another wave of collectivization came. In the June 1955, uh, sorry, the first secretary of the Central Committee uh, of the Communist Party, Antoni Novotny at the time, uh, later the president as well, uh, and the last, uh, uh, let's say, functionary uh, having the, uh, the function of president and the first secretary of the party as well, uh, gave uh, impetus to the new wave of collectivization. He made it clear uh, that the future of Czechoslovak agriculture lay in JZDs and state farms or only. The aim of the communist government was to achieve the uniform nature of agriculture in a world country to collectivize uh, the countryside in Czechoslovakia completely. How would uh, uh, farmers in Svatojansky US have felt in February 1956 when the district secretary of the Communist Party again lectured them on the necessity of so-called socializing the village and the uh, advantages of collective farming? That's a question. Uh, this was a mere two years after they had brought uh, to the end uh, an unsuccessful, unsuccessful uh, collectivization experiment in the form of the first JZD. The feelings of the farmers can be summed up uh, concisely as follows. The farmers knew the desperate state of collective farms and they were feared a similar fate. At the same time, they were aware of their fading ability to resist uh, the strong pressure of power. They did not believe in the success of collective farming, even though the catastrophic situation of the JZDs had improved in the previous two years thanks to the rich financial support of the state. 
they were afraid that joining a cooperative mean uh, meant entering into a social uh, uncertainty. Local, local uh, eyewitness uh, Maria Machitkova recalled that it took too long and hopes that communist regime will fall apart slowly vanished, replaced by conciliation with socialistic reality. Jindřich Hašek, uh, other farmer who came from a family, uh, family farm in Uhonice village, remembered that, I quote again, those who had recently still been uh, excellent farmers couldn't uh, understand what was happening to the village. In debates um, between neighbors, the once frequent sentence, it will fall apart in six months, uh, was heard less and less, end of quotation. The farmers understood that despite the fact uh, that independent farming uh, in private, on private land was guaranteed by the constitution uh, after the communist takeover uh, accepted uh, in May 1948, uh, it did not have a future in communist Czechoslovakia. The situation is perhaps best summed up uh, by other eyewitnesses, Eva Votočková, who moved uh, to the municipality when the campaign was culminating, shortly before the re-establishing of the JZD. I quote again, you thought that that's how it had to be. It wasn't possible to protest or do anything else. Life had to be lived. On this, witnesses concur. Uh, Nader Khrushchev's denouncement of the cult of personality at the 20th, of, uh, 20th Congress of the Communist Party of Soviet Union in February 1956, nor uh, the bloody repression of the Hungarian uprising by the Soviet tanks in the autumn of the same year deterred leading Czechoslovak communists from the total collectivization of the Czechoslovak agriculture. In June of that year, delegates at the, uh, at the party conference approved a resolution on bringing about the decisive dominance of the socialistic sector in agriculture by 1960. The goal was reaffirmed uh, at the third national JZD Congress in April next year. The municipality chronicler reported about the evenings, uh, events of autumn 1957 as follows, I quote, a blue and white automobile with Warburg symbol appeared in front of the local national committee building. The representatives of the agriculture department of the district national committee who had arrived in it first established the economic situation of individual farmers they uh, uh, then they were uh, then joined by a couple of agitators, mainly people from a, a local factory factory plant uh, in Lazně Bělohrad. The agitation work then took uh, three three weeks or so. End of quotation. It is let's say hard to imagine uh, that the local farmers uh, who already had one uh, collective farm experience behind them were uh, amenable uh, to the black and white speeches of the agitators. Nobody wanted to be the first to sign, and uh, the agitators at first left empty-handed. However, the pressure was great, this time lasting for uh, a couple of weeks. Apprehension and fear prevailed. On the evening of Friday, October 4, 1957, the music from the local radio station blared out and the hall filled up. 43 farmers attended the constituent meeting of the uh, JZD, the majority of the 59 in the municipality. In the presence of secretary of the district national committee, the statutes uh, of the old new JZD were approved. And Jaroslav Bichtiště, by the way, bricklayer by profession, uh, uh, was appointed as a chairman. After an intermission of four successful harvests, uh, the local farmers, this time with final validity, had been crushed. In this way, our village became socialistic and set off uh, on the path of uh, on the path to a new, happier future says the chronicle on this on this evening.
At this point, uh, we will turn briefly to the first year uh, of the Swatoyansky USJZD following its establishment for the second time. While the farmers had carried out, uh, had carried out autumn sewing independently, the work uh, in the spring was communal. A census of soil uh, and cultivated, la uh, cultivated land was carried out before January 1958 and the work was transferred to work units. The seeds used were uh, con uh, counted into a seed found uh, uh, and fertilizers was paid, uh, paid off from an uh, operating count account. Under the resolution uh, made at the constituent meeting of the JZD, communal uh, livestock production was to begin uh, from uh, June of that year. In total, uh, 180, 85 uh, cows were transferred, though pigs were, were not taken under, uh, under the JZD control. As yet, the JZD didn't breed hands itself and egg supplies were fulfilled by individual members. According to the records, uh, 1958 uh, was a relatively dry year. Heavily flattened rye and most uh, barley uh, were still uh, mown by farmers using teams of horses, while other cereals were taken care of by a machine tractor station. War groups from a patron factories and schools were employed to the harvest sugar beet. Maria Machitkova uh, remembered uh, the organization of communal work with some exaggeration as more or less a holiday. Let me quote again. You didn't have any worries. Wherever they sent me, that's where I went. There were no greater hurry, she said, uh, uh, of the work deployment. In the morning, the chairman announced uh, who had been assigned to a particular task. Groups were taken uh, to their spots and the group leaders spent a long time writing description of exactly what had been done. Only then uh, did the group leader have a snack. It was great uh, how long the snack would last. She loved it, and of, and of quotation. Uh, she was uh, recalling the, the loss of independent farm management and decision making. Uh, if I'm uh, to make an overview assessment of the turning points in the collectivization of the municipality in question, where uh, we have to look uh, to the three theses of development. Let's say that until 1952, it is possible in connection with uh, the JZD to point out that the persistent attitude of rejection only de uh, deviated from by a handful of enthusiastic uh, local members of Communist Party. Uh, the farmers' apathy uh, is subsequently weeded out uh, by the constant pressure of the party apparatus initiated centrally and implemented skillfully uh, at the district level, which the farmers uh, succumb uh, to while secretly hoping, as turns out uh, to be the case, that uh, is a temporary exper experiment. There are uh, material as well as human victims of the uh, agitation drive, uh, which could be dubbed as a hunt or uh, chase. After a period of collectivization silence, a kind of briefer period, uh, the shaken regime again gathers uh, its strength and introduces a new wave of constant attack. Uh, the interim stagnation of collectivization is replaced by an uh, offensive that leads to the resignation and submission to the collectivization project. The leadership of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia rejected the path of long-term coexistence uh, of a social state uh, and cooperative sector with a uh, private production, uh, as was the case also of, of, for example, Poland and partly also uh, Hungary. Instead, uh, the party advanced a concept of complete collectivization of agriculture under the administration of state farms, machine tractor station, and the JZDs. The main areas of agriculture uh, were, in essence, collectivized by the start of 1960s. 
and uh, the officials trumpeted the completion of the so-called the socialistic reconstruction of the village. In the period of 10 years, the number of private farmers were considerably reduced. Active, independent decision-making was replaced by a central planning. The independent farmer with a understanding, traditional understanding of nature, became an employee working shift. The large-scale capacity uh, construction of collectivized agriculture became dominant landmarks. The production uh, grounds of these agricultural complexes, uh, what is visible uh, till nowadays, uh, are similar to the factory halls uh, and do not belong to the traditional architectural uh, composition of the village. Let me conclude, um, uh, while at the end of the 40s the communist uh, leadership uh, expected agricultural production to uh, begin increasing during the curse of collectivization, at the end of the 50s uh, they were forced to regard as a success the fact that it was not falling. The level of pre-war gross agricultural production was not achieved again until the second half of uh, the 60s, nearly two decades after the end of the, of the war. After 1960, uh, the only people still carrying out private farming were uh, unregenerate individuals who tried in modest circumstances to defy adversity and with the greatest of effort to maintain their family tradition. In the 60s, 70s, and 80s, private farms were, let's say, isolated islands pushed to the very outskirts of collectivized land registers. That's all. Thank you for your uh, attention. Dziękuję bardzo. Przepraszam, panu doktorowi Urbanowi. Na szczęście dla naszego spotkania nie mam wiele do powiedzenia na temat kolektywizacji. Natomiast myślę, że ciekawym byłoby dowiedzieć się, i mam nadzieję, że wykorzystamy do tego pana doktora Urbana, w jaki sposób kolektywizacja wpływała, nie wiem, na mentalność ludzi, którzy trafiali do tego rodzaju gospodarstw. Ja nie śledziłem tego nigdy, ale zastanawiałem się i prowadziłem różnego rodzaju próby badań nad tym, jak szkolnictwo wyższe próbowało zmienić mentalność ludzi pochodzenia chłopskiego i w jaki sposób reagowała na to tak zwana stara inteligencja, a w jaki sposób ci, którzy sami byli owocem awansu społecznego po roku 1945. Proszę Państwa, trzecim i ostatnim niestety w tej części naszym prelegentem, naszym gościem jest pan doktor Kosmin Budanka. Pan doktor Budanka przyjechał do nas z Rumunii, do niedawna był jeszcze dyrektorem rumuńskiego odpowiednika Instytutu Pamięci Narodowej, kraju, w którym o ile wiem nikt nie planuje zamknąć Instytutu Pamięci Narodowej. Mam też tę przyjemność i chcę powiedzieć, że pan doktor Budanka już po raz kolejny jest u nas w Lublinie, z czego szczególnie się cieszymy. Tematem tego wystąpienia będzie, ja przeczytam ten tytuł, Uwięzienie po, po więzieniu, codzienność były więźniów politycznych w komunistycznej Rumunii w latach 70. i 80. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's a pleasure for me to be again in this beautiful place in Dublin. And for this, I uh, must thank to the organizers. And uh, of course, and you must uh, do that if you are not living in Lublin. Uh, and uh, special thanks for my friends, uh, Marcin and uh, Tomek. Uh, after the 1945, Romania too come to experience the violent implementation of the communist regime, uh, as did the other states in the Soviet sphere of influence. In this context, hundreds of thousands of persons suffered direct violence by being arrested, condemned, deported, relocated, expropriated, or affected by other repressive measures of the regime. With concern to the political prisoner, there are no exact numbers to this date, but the more realistic figures are of about uh, 150,000 uh, persons. 
even if the large majority of the political prisoners were released in uh, 64, they remained under the surveillance of the political police. Thus, when uh, they got out of the prison with bars and barbed, where uh, they got in a largest prison uh, delimited by the Romanian borders. Uh, due to the complexity of this topic, I will present only shortly uh, some of the aspects of uh, the situations that uh, the former political prisoner had to confront with in the 70s and 80s. A more detailed perspective will be presented in the future uh, article. This paper is based uh, on uh, documents from the former Securitate Archive, on oral history interviews, on uh, literature on this field and memoirs. The role of the Securitate. Uh, in Romania, the Securitate, set up in 48, uh, uh, represented the main instrument of repression, the armed hand and the sharpened sword uh, which stood at uh, the orders of the Communist Party and hit anywhere, anytime and any potential opponent imaginary or de uh, declared as such. While in these uh, first two decades of uh, the Securitate, uh, together with other repressive structures, used arrests, condemnations and other repressive measures to obtain control over society once the former political prisoners were released and uh, the consolidation of power was achieved, the communist regime did not need to resort to brutal force anymore. Uh, the excesses were replaced by an accelerated growth of informative surveillance in order to discover and neutralize from the, the very beginning any protests. The aim successfully accomplished was the disseminate among citizens the feeling uh, that they were carefully surveilled by the Securitate and to discourage any act of uh, disobedience. The fear inocul uh, inoculated in the population during the first two decades of communism was to become in time the most powerful weapon of Securitate. In an international context, like the invasion of uh, Czechoslovakia by the Soviet Union army, the Securitate feared that the international tension might trigger anti-communist manifestations in uh, Romania. Therefore, they uh, pushed concert, concerted actions to influence the former political prisoners to change their political views, to compromise certain persons that were considered particularly dangerous, to tear apart groups by inoculating suspicion among friends, etc. For all these purposes, the Securitate used operative technique interceptation of correspondence, graphological control, stakeout, photographing the subjects. But the changes in the methods the Securitate used were not actually radical. In the 70s and the late 80s, uh, there were many abuses and breaking of the law. Even though Romania had signed treaties uh, and uh, conventions regarding the protection of the human rights the final act uh, in Helsinki in 74, for example. For the better perspective on this uh, situation, I would remind you that in one note from the Securitate, from November 78, with regard to the attitude and the uh, situation of the former condemned for offenses against the Securitate of the state, there is a mention of over 14,000 uh, formal condemned persons. Furthermore, in 84, the informative surveillance was extended to over 13 uh, former condemned persons and in uh, 86 to over 17 uh, former condemned. Next, I will uh, present an overview on the main problems uh, these people had to deal with in uh, those years. Continuing with their studies, one of the main problem, uh, problems the former political prisoner had to deal after they were released was with resuming their studies and completing the educational cycles. 
in uh, some cases, uh, this was um, accomplished with uh, great difficulty and with a delay of many years. In other cases, uh, they were refused and this refusal determined uh, them to give up and accept jobs below their potential and qualifications. Uh, Flavio Brezzianu managed to graduate a faculty of economic studies in a program with limited attendance. Against all odds and pressures, he was subjected to uh, and, uh, his quite advanced, uh, advanced age. Uh, uh, Brezzianu said, I started at uh, 39 and finished at 45. And many had say, are you still going to do it? Uh, I was ashamed of my co colleagues who had higher studies. <clears throat> they were engineers, doctors, and so I finally did it in a program with limited attendance for six years, as uh, it was the habit back then. In uh, some cases, the Securitata had a word to say in approving or not to resuming of educational programs. For example, Trajan Mitrofan needed a certification from this workplace in order to sign up again to studying. But he was sent to take it from the Securitate, and so uh, he preferred to give up. He said, I didn't go to the Securitate because I knew uh, that they wanted to ask me to serve them, which I had never agreed with. So I did not graduate the faculty. Problems at the working place and uh, professional reconversion. Another major problem for them was uh, finding a job uh, after their release during the 70s and 80s. This was uh, regardless they had graduated or were trying to resume their studies and managed to graduate later. The fact that they had in their files a political condemnation transformed them into a parish and uh, most of the manager of institution and economic units would fail to employ them because they might have been a reason of trouble with the authorities. Uh, many among the former political prisoner had to accept to work as unqualified qualified workers. Uh, I uh, give you an uh, example of uh, Nikolai Popa. He said, I did not want to be supported by my parents, so I looked for work and found a job as a qualified uh, worker at a construction site. I keep working like this in several places. Almost nobody wanted to employ me and they would keep kicking me out whenever I finally found something. Uh, but uh, these jobs were not properly paid and they could not support themselves and their families. Uh, the people didn't take satisfaction in this work. Uh, therefore, some of them tried to apply for professional reconversion, especially when they had no possibility to continue with uh, their studies. Teofil Bodlung, for example, said, uh, I applied for a professional reconversion. I become a tool and a die maker. I was trained for six months and even thought I didn't have uh, technical, uh, technical abilities. I managed uh, to do a good job. The professional achievements were not acknowledged and uh, rewarded and this situation would add uh, to many other abuses which the former political prisoner had uh, to face. The surveillance. Uh, another particularity of uh, the life of former political prisoner in 70s and 80s Romania was the surveillance they uh, were subjected to by the political police. Even if the regime was on solid ground, the fear that these enemies were a risk to the political stability of the country was still very strong. This situation can be explained by the frailty of the communist regime that took the power by violence and by the need of the Securitate to maintain an important position in the state, even if the majority of those 
who had been imprisoned were trying to live their life and get over the burden of their past without engaging in suspicious activities. They were still surveilled and presented as a potential danger, thus justifying the high numbers of employees in the structures of repression. One fragment from an interview with the former political prisoner, Tofil Mija, is especially relevant to illustrate this relationship between political prisoners and the political police in those years. After we were released from jail, we were surveilled with the same intensity as while we were in jail. Uh, we could notice how we were followed each step we took, how we were marginalized, and uh, there had been many attempts uh, from the Securitate to have our image compromised among our collaborators uh, to steer conflicts with our friends, sometimes uh, even with our families. This is what the Securitate members were paid for, to trash the image of the survivors. Uh, their intention, their effort, their will was uh, such that we didn't get out of the jail alive. And they managed to accomplish that with some of us. And some of us who had managed to miraculously survive were put under surveillance after the release. The formal political prisoners were uh, called at the Securitate to give a declaration not only with the purpose to offer information and for intimidation. There was a second reason. The Securitate wanted to compromise their image, to isolate them and to put in a, a social stigma on them. Securitate officers would also pay them visits at home or uh, at the, their working place in order to destroy their public image. Uh, recruitment attempts. Surveillance of former political prisoner was direct, as mentioned above, but it was also accomplished with the help of acquaintances or colleagues from work. And uh, <clears throat> not less, the Securitate used other former political prisoner in this purpose and these were recruited while they were in jail by means of promises, advantages, or and blackmails. Uh, others were recruited before their release, which was illegally conditioned by their accepting the collaboration with the Securitate. Others got in the Securitate network after their release, as they were marginalized in society in order to have some benefits or because they were uh, blackmailed. Uh, sure thing is that from the perspective of the Securitate, as a structure of repression, an informer uh, on the situation of the former political prisoner, that also used to be a political prisoner was a very valuable acquisition. This kind of informer would be able to discuss with former colleagues of detention, delicate subjects uh, that weren't discussed with other people. In these circumstances, the efforts to recruit former political prisoners were numerous and many times successful, and for this stand as a proof the thousands of network files that exist in the archive of the former Securitate. Rehabilitations. As already mentioned, uh, it was only a facade that uh, the pardons in 64 gave the former political prisoner all their rights back. Some of them had been arrested and condemned abusively, even by breaking the communist law. This situation determined them to try to have these cases back on trial uh, and to obtain their rehabilitation in the court. These cases were not numerous, but uh, there were some successful uh, examples. It is uh, preciously these examples uh, that show how justice was done in the 50s, considering that were, were um, communist judges uh, tools who sentenced to, uh, them to jail in the 50s, and there were still communist judges 
those who rehabilitated them in the 60s. Uh, what was the public perception on the former political prisoner before 89? In a presented uh, briefly how a former political, I presented briefly how former political prisoner were uh, treated by the authorities. But in order to give a broader perspective, I will now try to switch my focus on the manner they were regarded in their close circles and by the rest of the population. The interviews reveal several opinions. Some say that uh, they were regarded with sympathy while others say they were given rather uh, a cold treatment as many of their acquaintances were afraid of bad consequences in the case uh, they would uh, have been exposed as having contact with them. Nistor Mann is among who, those who consider that they uh, didn't have social reintegration problems. He states that Former political prisoners were highly regarded even before the revolution. My colleagues and uh, peasants in the village greeted me with sympathy and uh, trust when I came back. In any group I had been before the revolution, when uh, they found out uh, I had been a political prisoner, they would give me a warm welcome. But Gheorghe Udra, talking other prisoner, former political prisoner, talked about social isolation and its long-term effects. Before 89, when there was the high school reunion, I also wanted to go, but I received a letter from a former colleague of mine. Uh, she said, uh, you should ask for the other colleagues' opinion if they want you to come or not. And of course, I did not go. And you see, all this humiliation leave marks. Conclusions. The life of formal uh, political prisoner was marked by harassment and pressure from uh, the authorities. And this, in these circumstances, they barely managed to find an uh, adequate job or to finish their studies, which eventually had an effect on the quality of their personal and family life. Although, once they uh, were pardoned, they were supposed to have their right restored, this actually never happened. They were further considered second degree citizens by the authorities. There was also a part of the society that excluded them because of the fear that getting close to a former political prisoner might bring people in the attention of the Securitate. The many problems and the situation mentioned in this uh, presentation are a small part of uh, all the things the former political prisoner had to endure. If they come, uh, can be multiplied and applied to all who experienced the communist jails. What is even sadder uh, is that these problems did not end once communists fell. They continued after the revolution and uh, had an impact of the former political prisoner and their family members. What I say uh, this, I uh, take into consideration the problems of property restitutions, the problems generated by uh, making public the files of those who collaborated with the Securitate without a proper explanation of the context that uh, they were recruited by name, uh, means of pressure and uh, blackmail, for example, for, uh, and uh, health problems. Therefore, we can state as a conclusion that unfortunately for many of the po former political prisoners, the release from uh, the working camps and from the communist prisons uh, was rather an apparent one, more like moving from a smaller jail to a bigger one in which many of them were forced to live until December 89. Thank you for your attention. Dziękuję bardzo. Rzeczywiście ciekawe jest to życie po życiu. Przemknął tu przez chwilę Tomek Osiński i patrząc na Tomka, 
przypomniałem sobie, aczkolwiek panowie pod żadnym względem nie są do siebie podobni, ostatniego ordynata Zamojskiego, który przecież po II wojnie światowej spędził chyba 8 lat w więzieniu stalinowskim, a po 56 roku był obiektem takiej intensywnej inwigilacji, inwigilacji ze strony Służby Bezpieczeństwa, która próbowała go skompromitować w kolejnych latach, między innymi na takiej zasadzie, że chciano go wmanewrować w przemyt różnego rodzaju rzeczy z zagranicy. Natomiast w 1980 roku moja koleżanka nauczycielka, jedna z lubelskich nauczycielek spotkała ostatniego ordynata na szlaku w Tatrach i rozpoznała tego mężczyznę. Rozmawiali sobie na jakimś kamieniu przy potoku przez pół godziny i pan hrabia w żaden sposób nie dał po pierwsze poznać po sobie, że jest człowiekiem z tak renomowanym pochodzeniem. Zachowywał się w sposób niesamowicie skromny, aczkolwiek nie był kimś, kto stwarzał takie poczucie, że czuje się osaczony, ponieważ przyznał się, jeśli tak mogę powiedzieć, do tego, kim, kim jest. Proszę Państwa, dziękuję bardzo serdecznie naszym gościom, którzy przyjechali do nas z różnych części Europy. Mamy niepowtarzalną okazję, żeby z nimi porozmawiać, wymienić doświadczenia własne naukowe i porównać to, o czym nasi szanowni goście opowiadali. Proszę Państwa, mamy 20-25 minut. Bardzo serdecznie zachęcam do tego, żeby zadawać pytania, żeby podzielić się swoimi refleksjami. Well, uh, I have to admit that uh, the only thing I know about the, the history of your country during the Cold War is that you had this uh, famous uh, prominent uh, school of semiotics at the Tartu University. So this is everything I, I know about Estonia uh, and the science in, uh, or education in, uh, in, in Estonia. But uh, my, my question is uh, uh, rather uh, a critical one because uh, as far as I understood, uh, you uh, took advantage of Estonia to, uh, to make some overall uh, conclusions on uh, teachers in Soviet Union. And I, I do not think that uh, Estonia is a good example for uh, you know, um, making a kind of uh, general opinion about the situation, the post-war situation in the uh, Soviet Union at all. Um, uh, I'm talking about that because uh, I come from Silesia and I also make some research on the history of Silesia, which is a kind of border, uh, borderland, border uh, region uh, with a huge German minority or majority, depend on uh, from what position you are talking, but after the, the, the end of the Second War, uh, World War, um, they, uh, the policy making of the, the government, communist government, toward the Silesia was entirely different from, from the policy making uh, or the policy implemented or the, the, or the I don't know, the um, guidelines implemented in uh, other parts of, of, of Poland. So it is, uh, you have to distinguish between, I guess, between the, the specific part of the country. Uh, I, I agree with your conclusions. It was, uh, it was uh, quite reasonable for me. Uh, I mean, the, the pressure uh, extorted on, 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 the, on the teachers. Uh, and there is a, one observation on the end fr from me because uh, it was very interesting, interesting that, that you, you mentioned those three points that were, or three parts of every lecture or every lesson, uh, that the lesson uh, consisted of uh, subject, of method and the uh, ideological background. I, I, I'm not sure if I, I understood it properly. Was it a kind of paradigm you had to uh, apply during the, the lesson? This, this last, uh, last point you mentioned, uh, this, this ideology or the Marxism, Leninism, uh, or was it only a kind of, uh, as somebody, I, I guess Martin uh, understood it in, in that way, that it was a kind of uh, small, um, uh, article you, you discussed on the end of the lesson. So, uh, because I wonder, everything we are teaching, uh, we are learning in school nowadays, is uh, has uh, uh, has its uh, ideological or political background as well, 
but uh, we are unaware of this. The, the children are not aware of that fact that they are living in the, for, for example, famous uh, gender studies or something similar, because there is everything in, in the textbooks or is, uh, you know, um, kind of um, uh, background uh, in, in the mind of, of the teacher. And the communists uh, were quite, um, uh, uh, how to express it, uh, uh, they were quite, quite clear about expressing was it, what, what kind of paradigm they are applying to interpret the reality. I don't know if I, I'm, uh, was, it, was it okay for you or not? Thank you. Po pierwsze, to takie, taka kwestia dotycząca no, porządkowa, kwestia pojęciowa. Pan używa także w tytule pojęcia rolnik. W Polsce przynajmniej do końca lat 50. No, nie używano pojęcia rolnik, to był chłop. Rolnik to jest związane z profesjonalizacją i to się pojawia, tak jak powiedziałem, koniec lat 50. i w latach 60. Czy Pana badania, w jaki sposób mógłby Pan coś na ten temat powiedzieć? Czy, 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 czy mówiąc wprost, czy po II wojnie światowej w Czechosłowacji używano pojęcia chłop, czyli przynależność, mówiąc marksowsko, klasowa, czy związane z grupą zawodową, z profesjonalizacją zawodu? To dla mnie byłoby ciekawe. Drugie, druga kwestia, czy postępująca kolektywizacja w Czechosłowacji wpływała na zmianę przywiązania, trzymając się pana nomenklatury, rolników do ziemi. Czyli innymi słowy, czy kolektywizacja były, była czynnikiem, jak to na przykład było w Polsce, wypychającym rolników ze wsi, a jeszcze bardziej wypychające ich dzieci, prawda, czyli te dzieci doskonale rozpoznawały, że no, na wsi już żyć jest trudno, jak to wyglądało w przypadku Czechosłowacji. Ciekaw jestem także, czy pańskie badania ujawniają różnicę między postępem kolektywizacji w części czeskiej i słowackiej, wynikające choćby z uwarunkowań wyznaniowych czy własnościowych. Bardzo dziękuję. Pan profesor Marek Wierzbicki, zapraszam. Ja mam pytanie do pani Eli Pilwe, jeśli chodzi o kwestię presji ideologicznej na nauczycieli w Estonii. Myślę, że nie podkreśliła pani tego, co zresztą profesor Kula wcześniej sygnalizował w poprzedniej dyskusji, że system komunistyczny właściwie w każdym kraju bloku wschodniego ewoluował, to jest oczywiste. I w związku z tym mam pytanie, jak wyglądała ewolucja tej presji ideologicznej wywieranej na nauczycieli w Estonii? Czy ta presja była jednakowa, jednakowo silna? I jak wyglądały reakcje nauczycieli na tę presję? Jest to o tyle ciekawe, że potem w latach 80. mamy nagle odrodzenie narodowe w Estonii, yy, powstają, powstają ruchy yy, na bazie ideologii narodowej, czy można być nacjonalistycznej yy, i to prowadzi potem do odzyskania niepodległości yy, przez Estonię. I widać w tym wyraźnie zmianę postaw mentalności społeczeństwa. Jak, wyglądała też, jak wyglądały postawy nauczycieli w czasie, yy, w czasie tego okresu odrodzenia narodowego lat 80. w Estonii? Jeszcze mam, mam pytanie do pana Iżego Urbana. Wiele uwagi poświęcił pan opisowi samego przebiegu kolektywizacji rolnictwa w, w Czechosłowacji. Natomiast jakby mniej mówił pan o tym, co znajdowało się w, w temacie pańskiego wystąpienia, czyli o wpływie kolektywizacji na przykład na zmianę statusu rolników indywidualnych czy chłopów. I moje pytanie właśnie, na przykład, jak zmienił się status materialny rolników? Kiedy przeglądałem dokumenty sowieckie, na przykład z Białorusi sowieckiej, tej, tej części, która należała do Polski przed wojną i tej, która była 
przed wojną częścią Związku Radzieckiego, to na przykład w roku 1946 władze partyjne wprost stwierdzały, że sytuacja na wschodniej Białorusi, tej sowieckiej tak zwanej, jest tak trudna w gospodarstwach kolektywnych, w kołchozach, że chłopi masowo uciekają, przechodzą tą dawną granicę polsko-sowiecką sprzed 1939 roku i zatrudniają się u chłopów kułaków, czyli tych bogatych rolników, ponieważ dochód na, na osobę w gospodarstwie kułackim jest cztero lub pięciokrotnie wyższy niż dochody, jakie przypadały na pracowników, członków kołchozów we wschodniej Białorusi. Moje pytanie na przykład, jak się zmienił ten status materialny rolników w Czechosłowacji i jak się też zmieniała ich mentalność, ich, ich spojrzenie na świat, kwestie ich obyczajowości, chociażby zarówno w życiu oficjalnym, w życiu prywatnym, jak się zmieniało ich świętowanie chociażby. To jest bardzo ciekawa kwestia. No może tyle. Dziękuję. Dziękuję, panie profesorze. Zapraszam państwa jeszcze do zadawania pytań. Pan profesor Jarosz. No, pytanie jest bardzo ogólne, ale chciałbym, żeby pan spróbował na nie odpowiedzieć. Zdając sobie sprawę, jak jest ogólne i jak trudno na nie wyczerpać ten, ten, ten temat. Moje pytanie jest bardzo proste. Znaczy, badał pan kolektywizację, badał pan opór wobec kolektywizacji, różnego rodzaju takie case study dotyczące walki z kułakami. Czy tak jak pan zna kolektywizację w całym regionie, a pana artykuły świadczą o tym, że zna pan kolektywizację w całym regionie na podstawie najnowszych prac, czy w czym się przejawiała ta specyfika czechosłowackiego procesu kolektywizacji? Czy możemy mówić, że kultura narodowa Słowaków i Czechów w jakiś sposób wpływała na kolektywizację, sposób jej przeprowadzenia i stosunek do kolektywizacji? Czy innymi słowy, jeżeli kolektywizowano wieś czechosłowacką czy słowacką, to ta kolektywizacja miała pewną specyfikę narodową czy kulturowo-cywilizacyjną. I kolejne pytanie jest związane z moimi lekturami słowackimi. Ja czytałem taki, pan na pewno też zna taki artykuł pani Zawackiej ze Słowackiej Akademii Nauk, która pisała o roli lo lokalnych aparatczyków w okresie kolektywizacji czechosłowackiej. I ona tam pisze, że, i to się zgadza z, polskim, z polską interpretacją przebiegu dynamiki kolektywizacji, że ta rola aparatczyków lokalnych, zwłaszcza na poziomie wsi, była bardzo, znaczy bardzo dwuznaczna, bo z jednej strony oni podlegali presji chłopów, którzy nie chcieli kolektywizacji, a z drugiej strony no, musieli wykonywać dyrektywy centrum władzy. Czy coś więcej można by na ten temat powiedzieć? Jaki jest pana stosunek do tego, do tego, do tego problemu? I kolejna, rzecz, I kolejna rzecz związana również z kolektywizacją. Jak zdaniem pana, które czynniki odegrały ważniejszą rolę w skłonieniu chłopów czechosłowackich do wstępowania do spółdzielni? Te, powiedziałbym, negatywne, czyli mówiąc tak najbardziej ogólnie terror i represje, czy te pozytywne, na przykład bardzo, bardzo szybko, jak sądzę, wprowadzony w Czechosłowacji system ubezpieczeń społecznych dla członków spółdzielni produkcyjnych, czyli członków ISD. Do w referatu rumuńskiego mam tylko jedno pytanie, ponieważ jestem świeżo po lekturze biografii Szałczesku wydanej w Polsce. To jest bardzo ciekawa lektura, zwłaszcza jeżeli porównujemy to z przypadkiem polskim. Czy pana zdaniem w stosunku do byłych więźniów politycznych w, w Rumunii odegrywała jakąś rolę specyfika narodowa? Mam, mam na myśli sposób traktowania, czy był jakiś inny, specyficzny sposób traktowania tych byłych więźniów politycznych, którzy byli narodowości rumuńskiej i narodowości węgierskiej. Czy to w ogóle jest badalne w jakikolwiek sposób? Dziękuję. Dziękuję, panie profesorze. Pan profesor Kula. Ja skorzystam, jeśli wolno, z okazji, że widzę państwa. Troszkę zapytam, postawię pytania idące może troszkę w bok, ale proszę wziąć pod uwagę, że pani mówię o pani Eli Pilwe, jest pierwszą Estonką, którą w życiu widzę. 
więc muszę skorzystać z okazji. Czy w okresie komunistycznym, gdy badano historię Estonii, no bo musiał istnieć jakiś Instytut Historii Estonii, no wszędzie istniał, gdy uczono historię Estonii, gdy mówiono o okresie międzywojennym, to z pewnością mówiono dogmatycznie i źle. To wiadomo, no, można się domyślać. Ale czy coś w tym powiedziano jednak, no jakiś fragmencik ciekawy, czy odkryto jakiś fragmencik nowy w Polsce przy całym absurdzie badania, przy wszystkich absurdach powiedzmy tak, badania i nauczania historii Polski w okresie komunistycznym, jednak pewne nowe rzeczy no, przestudiowano, wyciągnięto. Ja znam trochę sprawy kubańskie. No, kiedy tam byłem, to oczywiście oni szli w kierunku takiej historii dogmatyczno-marksistowskiej, ale jednak pokryli badaniami tereny, których wpierw w ogóle nie badano. I jeszcze jedno pytanie do pana Budeanka, do doktora Budeanka. Co mnie zaskakiwało jeszcze w czasach komunistycznej Rumunii, ja a propos byłem w komunistycznej Rumunii, miałem silne wrażenie, ale to mogę opowiedzieć kiedyś osobno. Co mnie zaskakiwało, to zainteresowanie władz rumuńskich, nie wiem czy samych Rumunów też, tym okresem rzymskim Rumunii, prowincją Dacja. Było to dla nas z Polski trochę zaskakujące, ponieważ na ogół system komunistyczny szukał swojej genezy w bardzo różnych rzeczach, no ale nie w starożytnym Rzymie. Do czego to władzom komunistycznym było potrzebne? A może wam, Rumunom przeciętnym, jest do czegoś potrzebne i władze skorzystały z tego. W końcu już po upadku komunizmu, zdaje się, zbudowaliście pomnik cesarza Trajana w Bukareszcie, no, który jest jakiejś imponującej wielkości. Dziękuję. To ostatnie pytanie w takim razie, tylko prosiłbym już teraz o króciutko. To już nie wiem. To ja już ostatnie. Pani pytanie. profesor. Ja krótkie pytanie zadam, można? Tak, to krótkie, tak, poproszę. Tak, proszę, tak chciałem. Do dwóch panów, ale zacznę te drugie, te bardziej krótsze, te drugie będzie czut ze wstępem. A mianowicie, jaka była siła do pana z Rumunii? Jaka była siła pana prezydenta Nikola, pierwszego sekretarza, przepraszam, Rumunii w 84 roku, dla, powiem dla młodych tutaj ludzi, że to była olimpiada w Los Angeles, po olimpiadzie w Meksyku, po olimpiadzie w Moskwie. I ja przeżyłem osobiście, że Rumunii, olimpijczycy, kandydaci na, na, na olimpijczyków i olimpijczycy pojechali do Los Angeles, natomiast Polacy nie pojechali. Jaka była jego siła, że on się sprzeciwił no, reżimowi moskiewskiemu? Pytanie. To pierwsze i to drugie. Miałem kontakt bardzo bliski do pana Orbana z Wyższą Szkołą Techniczną w Koszycach. Wielokrotnie tam bywałem, jeździłem w latach 70. u szczytu jak gdyby naszej władzy socjalistycznej w latach 70. dekady Gierka, powiedzmy umownie. Zaprosiłem rodzinę z Wyższej Szkoły Technicznej do swojego Podlasia. Tutaj wszystkich powiem, z Podbiałej Podlaski. Laski, Piaski, Karaski, Biedna Ziemia. I oni powiedzieli mi tak, Stasek, ty jesteś kułak. Ja to rozumiałem wszystko doskonale, ale byłem malutki chłopaczek, bałem się kolektywizacji, nie było takiego słowa kolektywizacja, nie wiedziałem, ale kołchozu, przeżywałem, zabiorą ziemię. I teraz tak powiem pan krótko, tych trzech etapach powiedział, jak to następowała kolektywizacja, rozumiemy. Dlaczego tak szybko to w Czechosłowacji poszło? Tanio, smacznie, zdrowo, tak powiem humorystycznie, w przeciwieństwie do kolektywizacji w Polsce, która jako tako ona była, ale była znikoma, to jest znikoma. To tak krótko. Pani profesor jeszcze, tak? To proszę tak króciutko i oddajemy głos naszym prelegentom. Prawda, że pan profesor Jarusz troszeczkę
o tym wspomniał, ale to jest jedno zdanie. Czy da się powiedzieć coś więcej na temat zróżnicowania wewnętrznego warstwy chłopskiej, jeżeli idzie o problem kolektywizacji? W Polsce mieliśmy bezrolnych, małorolnych, półrolnych, kułaków i tak dalej, i tak dalej. I ich stosunek do kolektywizacji, a zarazem ich status, który się w tejże kolektywizacji przed i po dział, był troszeczkę inny. No nasza kolektywizacja skończyła się w 1956 roku. Oczywiście to jest troszeczkę też inna sprawa. Ale to kwestie wewnętrzne, prawda, jako grupy społeczne wiejskie. Dziękuję. Dziękuję pani prezes. Thank you. So I'm going to start uh, from the last, and I'm honored to be the first Estonian woman you have ever met. <laughs> I hope you get a um, good impression. <laughs> and um, to, to answer your question, then, uh, there, of course, were new things and it uh, what what mattered uh, was the way they were written they were shown uh, for example um, right now i am writing my phd about the ideas of the land reform in 1919 and i must say that uh, a couple of estonian uh, politics that we have uh, uh, since since the beginning of uh, re-independency, we have kind, not kind of, but we have actually heroed. And uh, during the Soviet time, they of course were non hero they were bad persons. And I must say that uh, in this point of view, how they were um, uh, taking this land reform, I am kind of, having the same results as the Soviet uh, historians, Soviet time historians. So, um, I would say that uh, this very brief period of Estonian independence in these 20 years, it was difficult to research in Soviet time, but with, it was possible. Uh, everything that happened before, there was also, there was, of course, uh, new things uh, historians discovered, especially also in archaeology. It just mattered how you write it down. Um, the second question was uh, about the 1980s, yes? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, this, uh, the teachers I have interviewed have described this period desperate. On the one hand, uh, the government was desperate and they were pushing really hard this ideological, this ideology, ideology and everything that came with it. On the other hand, um, the the whole society was more free, had more courage. And if the teachers were before more careful about Estonian history, uh, about uh, showing the um, ideology at, at school lessons, uh, etc., then of course they also had more courage. Do, do you have my... Do you for example, again, my uh, my own uh, uh, memoir from that time when I wasn't at school yet, I was in kindergarten. But uh, I remember when we were sitting on the floor and uh, learning uh, the Estonian national songs. And it was, um, I remember the feeling, it was something very special. We we felt it, it's, it's unique, it's precious. So, I think the, all the teachers who I have been interviewed, they have told me that there, was, there were no limits more because everybody had this kind of very big hope. So. And to come to this first question then, I must apologize um, 
for this misunderstanding. I had absolutely no plan to make conclusions uh, according to Estonian uh, example because I was talking only about Estonian schools. And the second part of the question is that these three aspects had to be written down to every uh, school lesson, every single one of them. It was it meant a lot of paperwork, uh, but uh, and this um, example of newspaper, it was just one way to do it. Of course, uh, when some English teacher found it, used it, uh, it she could have used it uh, in her lesson in that time. Maybe it fit into history lesson as well, but it wasn't appropriate for math. So. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for a couple of really interesting questions. I hope uh, in a few minutes <laughs> well, I could possi <laughs> possibly to answer all of them, but uh, I will try my best. Uh, so first of all, uh, towards uh, the concept of using uh, 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 farmers and uh, peasants, uh, I would, uh, uh, if I can, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, plus it uh, with the uh, final question of so social pattern and division of, of the Czechoslovak uh, peasant society. Uh, so, uh, to be honest, uh, there are no, uh, let's say, special concept of using farmers or peasants. But uh, according, we are historians, or I am historian, so uh, according to the uh, history of Czech lands, uh, in the middle of uh, 19th century, uh, uh, the uh, private farming uh, were introduced inside, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the freedom of uh, uh, private farming land uh, were introduced inside the uh, uh, Austrian-Hungarian Empire. And uh, since then, uh, the peasants were free to uh, have their own land and uh, uh, to uh, dedicate uh, the land and the tradition as well uh, to the children. And to the uh, social pattern or division uh, of the society, of the uh, agricultural society, uh, I would say uh, I have to I have to help my, myself by, by uh, Czech terms uh, because, uh, you know, uh, rolnik uh, should be understandable in, in Polish language as well. Uh, uh, is related to the role, uh, so means uh, the, the part of uh, uh, rural land. Uh, so uh, 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 actually, uh, rolnicy, uh, peasants, uh, uh, were called like uh, uh, all uh, the agriculturalists, let's say now, <laughs> uh, who uh, were uh, cultivating some land but without any division of uh, 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 owning uh, uh, the farmers. Okay, uh, to be honest, uh, the, the, the farmers, uh, it's uh, difficult to, to, uh, to divide uh, uh, that, that, uh, that names uh, in English because English hasn't so, uh, so many uh, points, so many names uh, for uh, the rural society. Uh, but uh, I would try uh, to explain uh, in, in Czech terms. So, uh, rolnici, uh, sedláci and statkáři. Uh, uh, sedlák, uh, like a farmer. Actually, I'm not sure if the English has any better expression. Uh, was uh, the owner of land, and uh, it's uh, uh, let's say uh, is a uh, uh, specific uh, uh, ownership of land uh, uh, to be uh, running like a, a family uh, farm uh, with all that tradition, all that, let's say, uh, genera uh, generous uh, or generation process. Uh, and uh, uh, Statkar, uh, uh, maybe uh, somehow a few uh, can, can help me uh, if you know, the English has uh, uh, any other name uh, to divide. But uh, Statkar means uh, the owner 
of, uh, let's say, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Oh, okay, uh, the owner of a uh, big part of land, uh, 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 which size is so large that uh, it's not possible to cultivate it by uh, uh, themselves uh, in the border of family, let's say. So it's necessary to hire uh, uh, not only seasonal, but let's say regular employees to, to cultivate the land. Uh, and uh, about uh, that stratification, uh, I would say that uh, uh, related uh, to the 19th century and related to the uh, interwar uh, agriculture reform, uh, the peasants uh, were, uh, okay, uh, uh, the farms were divided like a, a, a small size. Uh, which uh, we have in Czech language such a spe specific uh, name, domkaři, kovorolníci and stavorolníci. Uh, uh, it it expresses that uh, uh, the keepers uh, of, of land are not uh, are really focused just on uh, farming or the cultivating the land, but uh, their main profession is like uh, in the industry, uh, in the uh, building industry or uh, and in case of uh, yeah, domkaři, uh, 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 it's like uh, to have a garden beside uh, uh, their uh, occupation, just not for real uh, production for the market, but for just uh, their own uh, uh, consumption. Uh, so such a uh, small scale uh, uh, farms uh, uh, were uh, perceived uh, in the scale of like uh, half to two hectares. Uh, still small, but uh, let's say uh, middle size after that, uh, because the, the perceiving of, of that uh, uh, scale of farms uh, were actually uh, moving, uh, what was perceived like a middle-sized farm in 19th century uh, was perceived like a, a large-scale farm uh, in the 20th century and especially uh, after introducing the collectivization. Uh, so uh, let's say that uh, between uh, 5 and 10 hectares uh, of ownership, uh, we call them uh, in Czechoslovak space uh, the uh, mid-sized farmers. And uh, uh, actually, uh, it's also uh, the, the historical problem because uh, uh, the ownership till uh, the uh, 50 hectares per family uh, for family farming were still perceived like a, 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 yeah. A, Family farming, sedlak, as I already uh, as I already mentioned, uh, and uh, uh, above 50 hectares, uh, they started to, uh, to be called statkar uh, because they had, let's say, uh, the, the border of 50 hectares were perceived like uh, that's the size where, uh, which uh, uh, the uh, one family can cultivate with just a seasonal. Uh, hiring of, of uh, uh, some help of some employees. Uh, so uh, I have, uh, I, uh, I hope a little bit I, I get it uh, uh, clearer, uh, but uh, no, to have uh, some, some, some time for other interesting, uh, interesting questions, I will, I will uh, continue. Uh, the question of farmer's attitude towards uh, the land, uh, that's maybe the most uh, interesting question in my eyes, uh, especially focusing uh, on the uh, children's generation. generation. Because uh, 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 in the process of collectivization, uh, collectivization uh, many, let's say, you know, the old generation farmers uh, uh, told to uh, their children uh, ready to move from uh, agriculture because after the communist takeover they, they, they already saw that it has no uh, any future, uh, I mean the private farming. 
so they uh, 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 let's say uh, uh, recommended to to the children's two sons uh, uh, to go to to uh, uh, other other brand of uh, occupation and uh, at the same time I have to I, I have to uh, mention that uh, the as the, uh, now, at the same time as uh, collectivization was uh, proceeding, uh, the massive industrialization uh, uh, were t taking uh, part uh, in Czechoslovak history. And uh, uh, together, uh, if we uh, will have a look to the statistics, uh, there were you know, dozens of thousands of uh, uh, um, peasants and, let's say, generally uh, countryside people moving uh, uh, to the to the cities uh, to the towns to the industry at all uh, I would recommend uh, just uh, shortly uh, the example of, of uh, while uh, Lena's book about uh, uh, about uh, this migra migration uh, from the countryside to the cities uh, 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 closely related to industrialization and and uh, collectivization. Uh, actually, in my eyes, uh, that uh, let's say losing the uh, traditional attitude towards family keeping land was the uh, main result of collective collectivization after yeah finishing of uh, almost 42 years of communist regime in Czechoslovakia. There was uh, visible in the, let's say, uh, number of uh, 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 previously farming families, uh, children, uh, uh, which or uh, wolves were, uh, let's say, uh, willing, willing able uh, to uh, start uh, the, uh, the tradition of uh, yeah, to to reborn the tradition of pride farming again, and it's also uh, I could recommend uh, the statistic of uh, uh, restitution because it's uh, yeah uh, visible that most of the restituent in nineties uh, just uh, uh, let uh, their uh, previously uh, family land to any other enterprises. Uh, uh, or the former uh, JZDs just reborn like uh, uh, cooperatives uh, uh, nowadays. Um, towards uh, the Slovak curse of collectivization, collectivization uh, yeah, there were definitely uh, uh, different, and it's related with a different landscape of Slovakia. Uh, mostly uh, mountain uh, landscape. So uh, let's say uh, that uh, the speed of collectivization in the Slovak part of Czechoslovakia was slower, but uh, at the same time uh, uh, harder uh, according, yeah, but uh, it's, let's say, general that uh, uh, there is a central pressure, a pressure and uh, there is a uh, uh, local uh, local statement, uh, uh, local condition, uh, depending on the let's say the, the uh, certain functionaries, uh, their attitude towards collectivization and towards the regime itself, and uh, yeah, uh, friendliness towards uh, uh, their uh, neighbors actually. <laughs> Uh, and it's also a great topic because we can we can uh, uh, talk about how the regime reacted to, uh, uh, to this because uh, uh, in the 50s they uh, introduced the uh, special uh, functionary uh, like uh, uh, yeah uh, local deputy and it was uh, uh, let's say the rule to have a, uh, this deputy it was paid functionary uh, from excuse me while oh, I'm yeah. <laughs> yeah sorry uh, uh, from uh, other district to have no relation with the local people and to force the, the state running politic and uh, towards the, the uh, condition of farms uh, attitudes uh, of work 
uh, uh, kulaks and uh, as well as uh, tradition. There were also such a specific, uh, uh, let's say, tradition, we call it uh, dožinky, uh, such a uh, yeah, uh, holiday celebrating uh, the finishing the harvest, uh, which was uh, uh, becoming to be a part of, uh, of communist ideology uh, and running together with the process of collectivization. So it was uh, actually uh, celebrated uh, with uh, the establishing of JZD and the running of JZD. Uh, yeah, there are uh, many points, but... Uh, uh, Please, thank you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I have no time, so <laughs> maybe we can finish it uh, uh, later. Thank you very much. Well, I will try to be very short. Um, uh, referred to the first question, the relation uh, between nationalities and the former political prisoner. Uh, to the first way, um, the situation was uh, the same, but um, uh, in the first time of the communist uh, period, in fact, uh, between uh, 45 and uh, f uh, 56, the, the Romanian political prisoner was uh, in a majority. Uh, after 56, the situation was changed a little bit because, uh, you know, it was the events and then the Hungarian Revolution. And after that, many uh, of uh, Hungarians from Transylvania reacted to these events and uh, made organization or uh, have discussion uh, about uh, this topic and uh, uh, they were uh, sent in uh, jail. Uh, the Germans uh, have uh, the same uh, different uh, situation because in uh, 45 they uh, were sent uh, in Soviet Union and uh, when come back home the wave of uh, arrested uh, was uh, finished and of course in uh, in uh, the 50s a part of them was um, have problem had problem with uh, the, the communist regime and was sent in uh, jails uh, but uh, the the um, special situation was um, uh, uh, in um, regarding to uh, to germans and uh, jewish uh, former political prisoners, because in the 60, 70, and especially in the 80, uh, they have possibility, of course, uh, in not a very easy, no, it's not so easy, but uh, they have this possibility to uh, emigrate. So, um, have this uh, gate to escape from this uh, huge prison, uh, but uh, Romanian have not uh, this, uh, this opportunity. So, um, for uh, the, the um, former political prisoner who stayed and live in Romania, uh, the situation was, was the same, but for Germans and Jewish was a little bit different. About the uh, third question, uh, the uh, participation of Romanian team to the uh, Los Angeles um, uh, Olympic uh, Games, um, the Ceausescu uh, was uh, in the front of Romania starting with the 65 and in uh, 68 he gave the uh, first important sign of um, uh, attitude to, um, in fact it's not uh, uh, attitude, a gesture, made a gesture uh, of um, um, opposition with Moscow. And in, uh, in uh, the 80s, this, uh, this position was um, highest. And in, uh, in Los Angeles, for example, the Romanian team was, uh, was there because the Ceausescu wanted to make opposition to the, the, the uh, Moscow and, you know, the, the rest of the uh, teams uh, from former communist uh, country wasn't. And this explains why. Uh, and why uh, the Romanian team uh, come back with a lot of um, distinctions, because have not uh, a strong uh, competition with uh, other communist countries. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, I don't understand the second question from uh, uh, Mr. Professor, and uh, if uh, it's possible to uh, repeat it, or uh, if, uh, yes, or in a, in a coffee break, a time of the coffee break, if you agree, yes? Okay, thank you very much.
Dziękuję Państwu bardzo serdecznie. Nie mieliśmy kilku panelistów, a i tak jesteśmy spóźnieni. Proszę Państwa, 15 minut i za 15 minut zapraszam wszystkich po krótkiej kawie na panel finałowy. Państwu jeszcze raz bardzo dziękuję. Wszystkim dziękuję. Zapraszam za 15 minut. Dziękuję.